Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. What's up, guys? It's great to have you all with us today. Excited to share a lot of information with you about e-assist and the legal and regulatory ramifications uh, that we're all encountering as we try to ride. So that's the big subject today. We're going to get into that uh, very shortly. We also have Larry Vardy with us today. He's going to have a report on the big honk and trike rally. That occurred down in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Larry had the opportunity to ride an e uh, cat trike Eola, and I think he's going to share some of his experiences with uh, riding that wonderful new trike as well. We're going to have uh, Denny with the sports today, and he's got a he's got a really interesting sports report with lots of stuff going on. He's going to talk about the uh, battle of the brands that happened at Sebring uh, last month. He's going to bring us up to date on the Texas Senior Games that just occurred. And uh, we got a couple of winners, recumbent riders that uh, we want to talk to you about. And we have a really important announcement, uh, kind of a groundbreaking one, uh, from our pal uh, Doug Davis, who's going to be with us today doing some other stuff as well, uh, about a newly sanctioned recumbent race. We're going to give you the details on that uh, a little bit later on today in the uh, sports report. We'll have some announcements of uh, other sorts to bring you up to date on some other recumbent news and, uh, and a few other surprises, I think, today as well. Before we get started, I'd like you to meet our crew. These guys are amazing. They help me out every month. And let's uh, get as many of us as we can on the screen here, Lars. Uh, first of all, there we go. We'll start right there. Lars is Lars Kamm, uh, our show director. He is directing from Salzgitter, Germany right now. Hello, Lars. Hi, folks. Good to see you. And uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, the media man himself, it's Trey Boing. Hi, Trey. <laughs> Hello, everybody. And uh, we're going to go to, uh, let's see, Des Moines, Iowa. Yeah, there is Tim Kane. He's going to be doing some moderating on YouTube today. Hey, what do you say, Tim? Hey, everybody. And uh, then that sports director dude I told you about, it's uh, Denny Voorhees. He's in Floral City, Florida, right and, on the Withlacoochee Trail. As yeah, and I may have see. to get off while we're uh, doing this. Right now, it seems to be pretty empty. But Okay, uh, yeah, we, we don't want to, to run yeah. over or anything. Yeah. All right, good to see you. Good to see you, Denny. Good to be here. All right, and let's uh, switch on over here. Well, let's get uh, Larry Varney. We got him right there. Larry is uh, in Cold Spring, Kentucky right now. I told you he was down in Florida recently. And uh, Larry's got a little segment to talk about, as I mentioned, and he's also going to be moderating our chat. Larry, it's great to have you with us. Hi, it's good to be here. Good to see everybody. Good, good. And uh, also, let's see, Doug Davis, we mentioned him a little bit earlier. Doug is going to be on and helping us with the e-assist segment and talking about that special announcement. He is down in, uh, in Dallas, Texas. Hello, Doug. Not so sunny and very wet Dallas, Texas. Hey, Larry, Gary. Good to have you with us today. And finally, last and certainly not least, Colorado Springs, Colorado, we find our uh, other moderator and uh, sometimes director, Larry Seidman. Hey, Larry. Hello, everybody. And it's nice to have you with us as well. Guys, uh, I want to... Uh, Remind you that we have live chat going both on uh, YouTube and on Facebook right now. And we really appreciate all your uh, contributions to the live part of this show. Your participation is important to us. Ask your questions, uh, make your comments, talk with your fellow bent riders on here. Uh, it's, it's great to have you on. Let us know where you're, uh, where you're watching from as well. We'll try to uh, pop those on the screen and mention them as much as we can during the show. So, Live chat, please make use of it. Now, we would love if you uh, help us out 
by subscribing to our YouTube channel. That is always important. Like us on our Facebook page. We would love to see that. And last month, we started a Patreon page. Uh, for those of you who would like to financially help us out, for as little as a dollar a month, you can help us continue to do what we do as far as covering our events and keeping our monthly uh, webcast open. If you feel that you'd like to do that, we have a few benefits for uh, our Patreon patrons. So check us out. I'll have a link in the uh, description below uh, on Patreon. We would appreciate that. Now, today's show is sponsored by TerraCycle makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And Trailside.bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida. Now, Andrew's told me for a limited time, you can get a free trike for your buddy when you buy a new Azub or HP trike at Trailside. Check the link that you see here, and I'll have it in the description below uh, for restrictions and details on this offer. And cruise bike, designed for the cyclist, cyclist who wants to ride farther, climb faster, and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And Terra Trike, host of Rider Fest 2020 in Atlanta, Georgia, Cleveland, Ohio, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Lincoln, Nebraska. Visit terratrike.com and See TerraTrike on Facebook for additional information on RiderFest 2020. And we are very excited to welcome our newest sponsor, The Hostel Shop, America's, America's premier recumbent dealer with the largest variety of recumbents, parts and accessories in stock and ready to ship to your door. All right, guys, that is great. Let's get on with the show. As I mentioned earlier, what we are going to be talking uh, today about is e-assist and the legal regulations, uh, laws around the world that affect people using e-assist on our recumbents and, of course, all kinds of bikes. So, um, first of all, let me introduce the people who are going to help me with this. Let's bring on, first of all, Steve Magus. Steve is known as Ohio's bike lawyer. Steve, it's great to have you back on. How are you doing? Great, great to be back. This is always fun. I'm happy to be here. That I, brought, is... uh, I brought friends. So yeah, well, we them. may, we we may need them. <laughs> props, uh, I, props. I am what I am, right? I am what I am. All right. And also, of course, uh, folks, Doug Davis is going to be kind of leading the discussion here. Uh, Doug is the owner of Bicycle Evolution down in Dallas, selling all kinds of recumbents and villamobiles. You are well aware of what he does. He's Mr. Wizard. So, Doug, uh, we are excited to have you on, too. Now, we were going to have uh, Doug's pal, uh, Alex Delaney, with us, but I think he's under the weather. So, uh Unless he's over your shoulder. No, he's, no, he's not no. He's not with us. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do what we can uh, and, and cover for Alex the best we can. So, uh, Doug, shall we, um, shall we start with the introduction and tell us what this is about? Sure. So, you know, we've, you know, we've, e-bikes are obviously a thing. Uh, E-trikes are a big thing for us and, and things. But, you know, we, we, we've had lots of questions and actually had a customer of mine ask a question that triggered this whole thing. What, Gary, we talk, started talking about this in December and said, you know, there's a lot of information out here, a lot of it wrong uh, and a lot of it changing. So we thought we should get together and have a, a, a kind of a roundtable discussion about this with engineers and lawyers. Uh, and we put the slide together, the very first one saying that, you know, lawyers and, and Steve could do this as well because <laughs> we have to have our safe, safe harbor <laughs> language here. Uh, lawyers are, are not allowed to give anything more than general advice. Legal situations are unique, uh, you know, so please don't get your legal advice on the internet. Uh, just like engineers, uh, engineers really don't have a legal restriction, but electronic repairs are do require special skills and knowledge, and uh, you probably don't want to do those with information you gain from the internet either. Yeah, generally speaking, you know if I'm giving you legal advice because you've written me a check. So that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> very important point, Steve. 
Uh, right. sometimes, sometimes we require that we fix people's bikes too. I yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah. All right. So why, why not get into it here, Doug? Let's get you started. Let, we're going to go through some of the nuts and bolts of eAssist just to kind of remind people what it is we're talking about. So the first thing we're going to talk about is why use eAssist at all? So Doug, go ahead and tell us. Uh, so a lot of, sure. Sorry, Larry. Sorry, Gary. The, uh, a lot of people use eAssist for a number of reasons. Um, Transportation is the big buzzword today. Everybody's very interested in in transportation alternatives um, and and green alternatives, and and ESS is certainly one of those. Uh, the edu the the trans Portland did a survey. It was a nationwide survey. And they got a number of responses. You can go through the the, uh, the 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 link at the bottom and find all this. But basically they were looking for uh, a transportation alternative. They didn't want to use a bicycle because they were going to arrive sweaty at work or they lived in a particular hilly area uh, mm -hmm. for things like that. And we see that here too. We saw a lot of e-bikes to people uh, that are using them as car alternatives. And uh, a lot of people will tell us they want to, they will go out with the assist on full assist and then they'll come back home uh, with it either turned off or even some of them allow extra load and they get their workouts that way. Some of them are adaptive. Uh, we have situations where people need assist for adaptive situations. We have people that uh, uh, assist because the, use assist because they're wanting to ride with a much stronger partner. So it's a, it's a family or what have you. And then the last thing is, uh, it, it's extending the riding season for some, extending their ability to ride for others. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's basically a way of, of, of getting more people out on the bikes and less people in on cars uh, where they're happier and, and, and having the, uh, uh, the, the bicycle as their transportation mechanism. All right. Okay. So I guess the next step is what is, is an e-bike? What are the different kinds of e-bikes and the different kinds of assist? Doug, go ahead and lead us through this if you will. Sure. So we got a couple of different kinds of e-bikes e e out there. Mainly an e-bike is a motor driving bicycle that the motor doesn't act as the primary form of motivation. It's a secondary form. It's an assistive form. Um, there are throttle e-bikes, and we're going to talk about that because it's relevant to some of the earlier discussions that we we, we will do it. But most e-bikes are designed to assist with pedaling. They will add some amount of power depending on what levels they're set. And you can see how this one's set up. This little picture here has got a number of three through 10 on it. Uh, and, they'll add, and they'll add some energy to the drivetrain to help the bicycle mo with motivations. So let's go to the next slide here. The th throttle activated ones do not necessarily require pedal assist. They have a little button or swivel or something that lets you push the button, push or activate, which makes the bike go on its own. Uh, and then again, the reason we bring this up is there's a lot of stuff about this later on, but you can think of it as one kind is fully assist and one kind is you have a throttle and then one kind has both. So let's go to the next slide. And there's a, Typical, what what this we've talked about this before. This is what's called a mid drive motor um, that's added on where the pedals are. And the reason they call it mid drive is a traditional bicycle. The pedals are in the middle. Uh, in the recumbent industry, we've also called it that. You also hear us uh, in our shop and certainly others. We call this a crank drive because it's where the cranks are. So, but the industry will typically call that as a mid drive. Uh, go ahead with the next one. And then there's the other side of this is a hub drive, which is literally where they replace the bicycle wheel uh, with a wheel that has a hoder in the middle of the wheel where the hub normally goes. And so that's where the motor lives on that kind of bike. There's one other one. I don't know if we have a slide of it or not, which we call, have called a chain drive where the, yeah, the motor the next there. Absolutely. Okay, there we go. Good job. Uh, so the next one is where the motor's in the middle of the chain line somewhere. Uh, and has and there's either a separate chain line or a gates drive, which is a, a, a synthetic belt drive or something like that, or it's on the opposite side of the drivetrain uh, and then adds the assist that way. So you've got, and those are the three primary types. Of course, you know, humans being what they are, I've also seen wheel drives and other things or, and, and even trailers that will push you along. So there's lots of different versions of these things out there. But the general case is that it's a, it's a, a motor uh, powered by electricity that adds some amount of power to the to the drivetrain. 
Okay, so that's a more technical uh, idea of what uh, e-bikes are. Now it's time to start looking uh, more specifically at legal definitions because this may be something different or may have other parameters involved. And that's really where the focus of our discussion is today. So uh, let's start out. This was going to be Alex's part, but we, um, Doug, I know you have a yeah. had a lot of uh, interest in dealing with the PSC. So tell us about, uh, let's start with the legal definitions of an e-bike and, and how this starts out. Well, yeah, let's let's back this up a little bit from there. Well, let's, there are a number of governing bodies that are involved in your e-bike, far more than are involved in your regular bike. And, and that's where things start to get confu confusing. Um, the Computer Pro Computer Consumer Product Safety Commission defines what an e-bicycle is from a product standpoint. And that's not what's on the road. And this is, uh, this is where Alex is going to explain it. Hopefully, Steve can help me with this because there's some legal <laughs> definitions here. Uh, I'm an engineer. I think things are supposed to be black and white, and this is never black and white. Uh, <laughs> They define what this thing is from a safety standpoint versus the National Highway Transportation Traffic Safety, which defines what a vehicle is, which is different. And then the Department of Transportation defines what a vehicle can be offered. The National Park Service plays a role in here. All the states have different definitions here. And then, of course, you've got underwriter, un underwriter laboratories that define some safety on this that everybody else points to about your batteries, the electricity, the charger, and the wiring, and the cornices, and everything else that can be uh, had anything to do with that. Well, let's jump over to Steve and see. Yeah, let's let Steve take a crack at helping me <laughs> yeah, out here. Do you have have you had interactions <laughs> with some of these organizations, Steve? I don't tell me. Not on the. I mean, not in the national e world, I guess. So. Uh, the Product Safety Commission will recall things. I've, I, I, every time I see something relating to a recall on a bike or a component or a fork or a seat or a whatever, you know, the product Consumer Product Safety Commission can come in at that point and say, hey, you know what? This product has become dangerous. We've seen crashes caused by a breakage of this or, a, you know, whatever. And then they have the power to... to uh, communicate with the manufacturer and then if it's bad enough to actually have the manufacturer uh, require uh, recall and give people the option of uh, you know getting things fixed and things like that so while the at the front end the consumer product safety commission has kind of a basic uh, definitional perspective they can get involved at the back end and i suspect the more complex the devices become, you know, the more likely it would be if things start catching fire or batteries start, you know, burning things up or whatever, uh, they can get involved in more in the e-world than they've been in the bike world. Every You don't see too many bicycle-related uh, recalls, especially at the high-end bikes, but they come through every now and then, and I try to kind of stay on top of that and post them. Right. So. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah, since we're talking about things that can go wrong and we're, the next thing was also going to be Alex's. He was going to talk about the responsibility and liability for the e-bike and yeah. uh, that sort of thing. Doug, you want to put some guidance to this here? Yeah. So, so basically what this was is, is there is a it, it, consumer product safety defines what a consumer product is. I mean, that's literally what's their name is. It doesn't define other things. And so when they have defined something like what is a bicycle, then they have a whole framework of regulations around how a bicycle is from the perspective of consumer safety. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's consumer safety. And they defined a bicycle in this code, and there's the, the number there, as a two-wheel vehicle or a two- or three-wheel vehicle with operating pedals and a motor of less than a This is from a perspective of what a consumer product is, not necessarily a perspective of a vehicle or what vehicle code is or anything like that. Uh, and then they went on right after all that. You have to read through all the language, and they exempted a whole bunch of stuff. So they defined this bicycle. Then they said, okay, but everything here – is also not really a consumer product like track bicycles, recumbent bicycle. I mean, so they they literally wrote wrote themselves right out of the right out of what some of the things we consider bicycles uh, are living in that exemption out there. Okay. Uh, and so it's really it's a little bit of a maze there, which is why we use that icon earlier. So it's a start and maybe something that the state legislators might have looked at just for. Uh, 
beginning to look at how to put some laws together. But as you can, anyone can see, that doesn't cover that much. Like you said, it skips stuff. It's not very comprehensive. So now let's jump uh, into the responsibility and liability for the um, uh, for the e-bikes. And, and I think there's two parts of this that we discussed, Doug. One is, what happens if you break one of the laws that's out there? And the other part, the two ways to get discovered, right? Some, uh, some official stops you and says you're violating some law, or there could be some sort of accident, in which case there may be some official taking a look at that. So there, this is going to be broken down into criminal versus civil uh, suits that can be brought. Um, and the first thing we're going to look at here is the different people that could be responsible. So we're looking at whether something is store-bought, if it's a store conversion, or if it's a, a do-it-yourself. These are the three main components of how you're going to end up with ESS. So um, Doug, maybe do you want to start? And Steve, please feel free to jump in here if you have something to add. Doug, go ahead and, and let's start with store-bought because that, yes. that's you. Yeah, that's me. Uh, well, we do store buy and conversion. So what we understand is that as the as the retail outlet or the seller, we become liable for uh, education of the consumer of what the laws are on the destination. Because of course we sell in places beyond the Texas borders, uh, and we have to somewhat be a little bit versed in neighboring states and other states, things like that, and the state laws. And we have some specific responsibility to educate the consumer about what they, what the laws are in their destination. Um, and then the liability of what that consumer does then falls onto them if we did our job, you know, you know, educating them. The, the flip side is, though, that we also have liability if we exceed the parameters of those laws. So if somebody brings me a bike in Texas where we have a 750 watt limit and they bring me a 1500 watt motor, um, I can't install it. Um, that My insurance won't cover it. The law says I can't do it. The, I mean, I become crim crim criminally negligent by putting that bike together and letting it out my door. Just like you do if you're at home and you build this thing because you are clearly building something that is outside of the parameters of the law you're supposed to be operating in if you run it on the road. Now, if you go run it on, run it on your own pasture, none of this applies. So, that, and I'll let Steve carry it from there because I think that's the scenario he knows better than I do. Go ahead, well, Steve. Yeah, the, you know, uh, traffic laws are uniquely by the state. So uh, each state has its own traffic laws. There are some, you know, we're seeing this in the e-scooter world, though, where um, a lot of states don't regulate e-scooters. Uh, some state, a lot of states have passed e-bike laws. Some states haven't. How do they, you know, what do you, where do they fit? Ohio had before, about a year ago, uh, we had e, uh, we had uh, motor scooters and mopeds, which are different than motorcycles, and they are different than electric bicycles. And so when the electric bicycle law was passed, uh, the, uh, the, uh, there was a special category carved out that makes them part of the bicycle world. They're not part of the moped world. They're not part of the motorized bicycle world because uh, motor, and that was a big issue we had here because motorized bicycles were defined in terms of horsepower. And converting horsepower into some electric uh, medium is is a, a kind of a scientific mathematical uh, uh, question that that didn't seem right for the consumer to try to do on his own. So now we have the the three classes, which I'm, I think we're going to talk about in a minute. You know, we have here in Ohio the three classes of electric bicycles uh, based on the characteristics of the particular thing, and if you exceed that. Then you don't, you're, you you technically wouldn't fit into the legal model, and you could be driving an illegal vehicle. From a recumbent perspective, we had a few years ago, uh, one of our uh, board members at the Ohio Bicycle Federation uh, had a cat trike, and he realized that the uh, definition of a bicycle uh, was uh, not going to capture his his particular 
bike because it, it I think the definition said two in the back and one in the front and he had two in the front and one in the back so he managed personally to get his legislator to change the definition of a bicycle that was important because let's say he had a crash and he says to the officer well, I had the right array and the officer says well no this thing you're driving on the road is not street legal it doesn't meet the definition of a, a bicycle or an e-bike or a whatever it is you think it is. And so, therefore, you don't have the right of way and therefore you lose. Um, and he was concerned about that. So that's why he got that passed. Really Short, important. No, go ahead. Yeah. yeah I'm just going to say it's important. And this is all coming back to definitions, isn't yeah, it? I mean, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is where the wild, wild west comes in here. They can make laws uh, about e-bikes. And, but it depends on how they define them. And it has to do with the wheels that we've talked about, the number of wheels and where they're located and all right. that kind of stuff. I wanted to, um, maybe this is a good point to bring in this question here uh, from Blaine Ackley about insurance. Steve, maybe you can help us with this. Um, so in some uh, jurisdictions, obviously in Oregon, he's saying that uh, he assisted a bike, a cruise bike, was considered a motorcycle. Um, it, do you have anything to, to get, give us some guidance on this? Is that something that's common? Um, I don't think so. I mean, it, like when we pass the the law in Ohio, it specifically says an electric. If you meet the electric bicycle definition, you are in the vehicle definition, which is how Ohio defines things on the road. It's a vehicle, but it, it is not. A, a motor vehicle and it is not a motorcycle and it is not a motorized bicycle and it is not a moped. So it is its own category of stuff. Um, and if you're not defined under the law as operating a motorcycle, then you shouldn't have to pay for a motorcycle insurance policy. So. For sure. All right. So yeah, now let me go ahead. This is one, this is what I know that Oregon just changed theirs like Oh gosh, I want to say either in in eighteen or at the end of eighteen they changed it to adopt part of the three bike three thing code, and so it's a it's a twenty mile seven hundred fifty watt state. Uh, okay. So anything below that falls into the bicycle definition. However, they have um, uh, the the two tandem wheel thing in their bicycle de definition, unless they've changed it recently. I have to go look. <clears throat> Well, yeah, the e bike has got two tandem wheels. Blaine just came back and said, in Oregon by law, an e bike is a bicycle. So there's clearly yeah, some so, sort of misunderstanding there. Right. And yeah. the whole insurance thing gets funny, too, because uh, at least in most places, if you have homeowner's insurance, you're covered for bicycling. If you run over somebody, it's covered under your homeowners, not under your auto policy. You can use your auto policy for other things. Uh, if you get hurt, you have claims and things like that, but your homeowners actually provides uh, your liability coverage. Okay. So no matter how we define it, what we're going to be talking about here is where these e-assisted bikes can or should be ridden. And there are laws involved, which is where we're focusing. But I found this uh, graph I thought was interesting from the League of American Bicyclists uh, from a couple of years ago. This was actually a survey that they took of the general public about where they thought EASIS should be ridden. And as you can see, no, nobody seems to have any problems with the roads, bike lanes of any kind there. Um, but now as you start getting towards uh, trails and paths, uh, and uh, bike trails and certainly sidewalks, you can see less and less people are supportive of that sort of thing. So that's kind of what we're dealing with. And we are going to talk more about trails for especially recumbent bikes, which is what we are all about. Uh, trails are a huge part of where we ride. So we want to focus on that a little bit later on. At this point, though, I want to kind of start um, delineating uh, the locations of these regulations and laws that we're talking about. And let's start big. So let's start globally. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, laws where we know and on a global level, not just focusing on the U.S., but around the world as well. As well. We do know a little bit about what's going on in the EU, and we have a person who lives in the EU uh, right with us. Lars, can you uh, bring yourself up there too? So um, Lars, we're going to talk a little bit about, we have three slides here and we'll pedal through those if we can. But uh, generally speaking, Lars, tell us what the e-assist uh, the e -assist regulation and laws are like in the EU as you experience them. Well, basically, as far as I know, 
Uh, we have two uh, kinds of e-assist in the EU. Uh, EU. The one is uh, you can have uh, e-assist up to 250 watts, uh, which uh, can assist you uh, until you reach 25k an hour. Um, in this case, the bike is considered a bike no matter what. It can uh, ride wherever normal bikes or trikes can go. Um, you have no legal implications if you um, if you have this kind of electric assist. Um, the other thing is uh, you can have above uh, 25k up to 45k, I believe, um, assistance. Um, but then you actually are well considered uh, a light motorbike. And so you have uh, you have to have a special insurance policy. Um, you you'll have a number plate that uh, specifies your um, uh, a light motorbike, uh, and you can go on bike paths. With was uh, that a with... was that an EU thing or a German thing, Lars? I think it's only a German thing. I'm not quite sure on that. I, I believe you're referring to me. I'm not real clear on this, but I'm, I know HP put together that trike last year to meet those specifications. And I think it was yeah, German. Exactly. Okay. It, yeah, had, it has some, some, some special, um, uh, on the in engineering side, some uh, special requirements um, you must need to uh, meet to, to uh, have it insured and uh, road legal. Very good. And then next slide, if you could, Trey. Um, this is a more recent uh, thing that uh, I saw, and I think Doug did too, uh, in France specifically. Um, so what happens if you, uh, if you violate the law? Well, uh, in various jurisdictions, of course, uh, you get various kinds of penalties. But we can see that in France, they're taking the... Um, if you take an e-assisted uh, bike and you modify it in a way that violates the law, they are very serious about this and uh, have criminal penalties that involve both uh, monetary and perhaps even jail time involved with it. So as you can see, it's really, really a serious, uh, it's a really serious thing there, at least in France. And I ex expect you'll probably see that elsewhere. Maybe it already is, but in, in, uh, in Germany, in Germany, by the way, it's uh, basically the same. So when you tune your your e assist to go faster, uh, then basically you lose uh, insurance, and um, it's considered um, riding without a license and without an insurance, uh, which can uh, uh, be punished by law. So it's basically the same. And then here, uh, a couple people backing you up, including Marco, our pal. Hello, Marco. All right. So that thank you, Lars. That was that was very helpful. Let's uh, well, let's let come me, out. let's add something about the U.S. here, sure. Um, right quick. So in the U.S., well, the, yeah, we'll go back to this slide here in a second. But in the U.S., we need to be very careful. We talked about the liability insurance. And that your homeowner's definitely your coverage on your bicycle and your e-bike as long as it fits in that bicycle definition. When you're outside of that envelope, if you build something or manufacture or buy something over the internet or wherever, outside of that definition, you may lose all of your liability coverage as part of that. And not only that, you know, not only could you be criminally negligent for it if you knowingly did it, uh, but you can, you won't have any protection. You won't have any insurance. And if, if you're the cause of an accident, that could be incredibly costly. And I had a guy who called me who had uh, lost his license through a DUI and he had bought one of these, you know, souped up Chinese motors and put it on his bike and was claiming it was an e-bike and he got stopped by the state patrol and they charged him with driving without a license while on suspension which is uh, not a good place to be in Ohio. So yeah, there's, you can get not just a ticket, but it can become a, a criminal matter uh, just from driving around on this thing if, if you're in the right set of circumstances. So very good. Got to be right. careful. Let's, uh, we were going to have a section here on the U.S. federal law, but my well, understanding, go ahead, Doug. I was going to say it's not that much there, but go ahead and tell no. us. Well, what I was going to say, we're back on this slide for a second. There's a couple of things I want to point out here. Um, if you notice, we're the the U.S. is the highest wattage in a, from a standpoint. We have 750 watts. 
China's really interesting. The 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 twenty five kph is very slow, and the the little e bikes they make alarms. They go off when you when you ride one. If they go above fifteen kph, they go dee, 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 to tell you to slow down. It's really funny, but. They have what looks like a couple of, you know, when you get into the congested areas where the e-bikes are really popular, the police will, there's a traffic police, there's a version of their police, we call them traffic police. They they have a little what looks like rollers that they pop out of their trunk and put on the ground and they put your e-bike on it and they twist the throttle and the thing goes faster than 15 kph and doesn't alarm. They take your bike away from you. Ooh. Bye bye bike. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so it's gone. And, you know, and you're seeing this kind of stuff now starting in other places because, it's not very hard to build a really fast e-bike, but you know, they're, 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 the people that do that are operating outside of what an e-bike is, which is really, they just want it to act like a bicycle with assistance. Right. Okay. Very good. All right. So um, we're going to go to a section here that Steve is going to take charge of where we're going to start talking about the state definitions. And we're going to, of course, we're going to focus mostly on Ohio because that's where, where Steve is. And we can't go through every state's uh, laws, but um, we're going to give you some links to um, the really nice site for people for bikes where they will talk about uh, each of the state's laws and you guys will be able to check out your own state. But uh, Steve, let's get us started here with uh, yeah. definitions and just go ahead right. and, and tell well, us the, what the goes people, on. Well, right the now. people for bikes entity has done a good job of promoting a uniform uh, set of definitions. So the class one bike is a, is a bike where you have to pedal. It doesn't just go like a motorcycle where you twist the throttle and the top speed is 20 miles an hour. A class two bike is a, you can throttle it. You don't have to pedal and it'll go 20 miles an hour. And a class three bike is a pedal assist, but it'll kick you up to 28 miles an hour. Um, in Ohio, uh, and I think there's 20 some, 30 some states now that have adopted this uh, class one, two, three breakdown. Uh, and then in Ohio, they went further and said, uh, class one and two, you can ride them on most uh, trails. Uh, unless the owner of the trail says you can't. On a class three, that's the opposite. You're not allowed to ride them on the trails unless the owner gives you the okay. So they, and the other things with the class three is they, in Ohio, they require you to be uh, over the age of 16 and to uh, wear a helmet. Anyone on a class three bike has to have a helmet. Now that's the only vehicle in Ohio, I, I think that you have to have a helmet on. You don't have to have one on a motorcycle. You don't have to have one on a bicycle. We have some uh, cities that have passed helmet laws for kids, but none for adults in Ohio. So, um, but the, the, the class three helmet law would apply to anybody riding a class three e-bike in Ohio has to have a helmet on. So, All right. It's, it's interesting because this is a good point to bring this out. There's 30, what, 32, 34 states now that have op adopted this, but it's yeah, not, so. uh, it's not a hundred percent adoption. So even though they're classified as a state, you still have some edges uh, around this where they're not clean. They're not cleanly adopted for the class three is a great one. Uh, some states require speedometers for class three. Some states don't. Some states require helmets. Some states don't. Uh, and some states, the class three is a maximum even without the motor. So That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so our, our, yeah, our state's that way. It's 30, 28 miles an hour maximum. And since you're required to have a, a, a speedometer, you no longer have a defense to prosecution, which was, well, my bicycle doesn't require to have a speedometer. Right, right. So that's um, how I did it. Yep. Uh, Trey, can you pop up that uh, map slide in the next slide there? there you so go. I wanted to mention that I did uh, talk with um, um, the, uh, a spokesperson for People for Bikes, Morgan Lumley. And actually, we, we were going to have her on, but she wasn't able to make it today. But I had a, a nice chat with her. And what she told me basically was this three class system that you guys are talking about is the basis for the vast majority of state laws. Like Doug said, there are, of course, many exceptions. So the green states that you see on this map, which is the majority of states, have adopted that as its basis. Um, and, and more and more are coming online. She said, and she's involved with the lobbying at the state level for all the states. She said that they're mostly falling in line with this concept. And she expects certainly in the next year or two at the most that almost all the states, if not all, 
will fall in line with this three class concept, at least at, at the basis of it. Um, Doug, go ahead. You were um, you were going to start talking then about uh, human power versus assist when it comes to the speeds of these. Then, yeah, well, that was where I was headed toward. Toward was that that some, like I said, some of the model the it's it's like a maybe an an eighty five ninety percent fit in this model legislation that they talk about. Some of the states have have sprung away from it in for for some good reasons and some reasons you just kind of wonder what they were thinking. Yeah, the the the. The e-bike speed limit one is one of those that you go, okay, that makes a little sense. Um, the helmet one's another one. You know, again, there's a bunch of these little things that are just not quite perfect fits. So what what that really brings you to is is a question of what happens when you go from one state to another. Um, you know, which is which is kind of interesting because uh, you're you're required to operate within the state transportation laws in the state that you're in. Not right, and you don't have this with cars because the general car thing is uniform around the country. You can drive your Beetle, you know, from here to California and and be lawful on the roads. Not maybe not necessarily the truth with the uh, the e bike. So, so Steve, specifically, I'm looking at that map and I see that uh, here in Ohio we're green. We've got the three class system as you described, and then right next door there in West Virginia, it's a red state. And uh, they re regulate them as mopeds or motor vehicles, right? So now, tell me what happens if we <laughs> go from Ohio right across Marietta there, and they say go over the bridge and head to, to West Virginia. What might happen? You could get a ticket. You could get ordered off the road. The thing could get confiscated. I mean, it, it's a if it's de if it's determined that you're driving a vehicle or some device that is not. Uh, suitable for the roads in that state, then they can order you off the road. Uh, I had a, I borrowed a buddy's car back in uh, law school and it was, uh, uh, I got stopped by the police and he said, this car is a death trap. You're not allowed to drive it anymore because the lights weren't working and the brakes were bad and it was leaking this and spitting out that. And he ordered me out of the car and, and uh, kind of red tagged it like they would, uh, something that you're not allowed to drive. So well, I, of course, I, Steve, yeah. because every everybody he encounters, <laughs> the officer encounters like that's going to say, it's not my car. That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Most common defense, I think. You could probably but, but if that happens to you on a bike tour in West Virginia, that's going to be problematic. So I always tell people, consult local listings. I mean, you got to, if you're going to, whether you're riding a bicycle or an e-bike or whatever, you know, you're if you're touring from here to Michigan, you've got to know what the local laws are. Even in Ohio, we have state traffic codes, and in every city in Ohio has the right to pass its own laws, and many of them do. They're not supposed to differ from state law, but sometimes they do. And if you're riding on a sidewalk or a trail, they're allowed to do whatever they want, basically. So, absolutely, yeah. really good. Okay, and then uh, Steve, we also were going to uh, talk. We had you assigned to the question about what about uh, about states states that might have banned e-bikes entirely? Do you know about that? Uh, the only one that I'm familiar with is New York, and yeah, they're um, the poster child for this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and there was a bill that was percolating at the end of 2019. The governor was going to sign it, then he didn't, and he said it was because there was no helmet thing, no helmet law, and some safety issues. And they sort of joined electric bikes and e-scooters into that bill, which which seems like an odd set of uh, bedfellows for uh, uh, that kind of a law. But I think the concern in New York is the uh, the folks that juice up the bikes too much uh, compared to, uh, you know, if you're if you're running around New York City at 40 miles an hour, I think that's uh, it's something because the thing is, is juiced up more than it should be. I think that's a concern. There was an, an article I read this morning in from late January that said they were reconsidering uh, that that uh, and adopting uh, uh, something that would make the e-bikes legal. But, you know, up to this point, I think that's a state where where they are not technically legal so well there's yeah. jason's strike adventure yeah right that's there. interesting hey, <laughs> and it's not going to happen with this governor so and yeah. Doug, i don't know if we want to segue at this time i know you have something to say about about 
these legislators, people making the regulations and laws being affected by people taking advantage. And I know, should we say that towards the end there, maybe? Yeah, let's yeah. save that one towards the end. get back to that. I know you wanted to do that. All right. Uh, I, I want, I want to, I want, I'm itching to do that one, but let's save it to the end. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to talk about more specific and smaller entities now. We're going to talk about municipalities and trails. Alex was going to handle that. I think we covered the municipalities and we can probably lump them into the trails as well. Steve mentioned earlier that they these can uh, these entities can promulgate laws or regulations that may be different than the state laws or federal laws. And uh, let's let's talk uh, let's focus on trails because I said we you know this is a big part of what so many recumbent riders uh, use. And yes, the laws can be different. The regulations can be different on any trail. And Doug, I think you mentioned it depends or Steve. Who owns that trail? Yeah, Who cool. is in charge, right? So right. Um, go ahead, Steve. You want to say something about this? I said there's the Ohio law it, it punted when they passed the e-bike rules. It's It says that in general, you can ride a class one or class two on a road or on a, a basic a hard trail, like a multi-use path, a MUP, or a, what they call it is a shared use path, unless the county or whoever owns it says you can't. You go down two more sections, it says no person shall operate a, a class one, two, or three bike on a path that is intended to be used primarily for mountain biking, hiking, equestrian use, or other similar uses, or any other single track or natural surface trail that has been historically reserved for non-motorized use, again, unless the uh, the owner kind of flips the button and says uh, that you're allowed to do that. So the, the distinction I sort of draw there is if it's paved, you can generally ride on it. If it's not paved, uh, then the, the general rule is you're not allowed to ride on it unless they decide to let you. Steve, let me ask you, this was a question that Alex was going to uh, discuss, but I've had quite a few questions in the run up to this show from folks talking about um, riding their e-assisted uh, trikes or, or, or such that have disabilities. And the uh, implications of the uh, American with Disabilities Act on uh, what we're talking about here today. So let's stick with the trails yeah. and uh, the folks that get on those trails. How are they affected by what we're talking about here in individual trails saying, no, you can't ride your e-assisted uh, bike here. What about if you have a, a, a disability? How does it affect them? That's an interesting question. I haven't seen that. I've seen that come up in some um, other arenas, for example, in the e-scooter world, uh, the uh, a, a group, a disability rights group, sued all the e-scooter companies because they were uh, they were allowing all these e-scooters to be deposited all over the sidewalks and blocking uh, people with disabilities from using the public way. So, in that regard. Uh, the uh, you know, the it's sort of the opposite where they're trying to kick the e-scooters, the e-bikes e and e-scooters off. And basically they're talking about the dockless sharing system, not an individual device that you would own. So if you flip that the other way, I you know, they're in California where that case came out, there are some pretty strict uh, uh, disability rights laws and, and disability rights groups and disability rights lawyers that enforce uh, those laws. So that it may be a more state to state uh, adventure once people start using their e-devices as uh, assistive devices. Um, you know, and again, in Ohio, you're, you're allowed to generally ride them unless they kick you off. One argument would be if they kick you off would be that, hey, you know, this is this is my assistive device and I need this to move around. And then the counter argument to that is at least in Ohio, riding your electric thing on the road is very different than riding on a trail. And once you ride on, once your wheels touch the trail, you're now a recreational user and an entirely different set of liability laws apply an entirely different set of, of general laws apply because you're now a recreational user of this trail. So uh, that is, that's where sort of the rub is where can you be kicked off of a recreational trail compared to the roadway? And I think the answer is no on the roadway. If, as long as you meet the definitions, I don't know that they can, can kick you off the roadway, but they, 
you know, the under the laws, at least as it's been passed so far, nobody that I'm aware of has tested uh, that law around the country based so, on so that's uh, having a the, disability. Yeah, that's where that's where it's going to get cleared up, I guess, like so many other yeah. things. We start getting a lawsuit, we we'll get some litigation, and then we'll find out how that plays out, I suppose. It's another complication yeah. to what we're doing here. All right, All right. guys, I want to uh, kind of scoot along here. There was We have a section about private land. I think Doug already touched on that. Pretty much, I think it's fair to say, uh, if it's on your own private land, you can pretty much do whatever you want. We also want to talk about, uh, in terms of complicating things, besides the definitions, uh, we're talking about two, three, and four-wheeled uh, bikes and trikes and such. There are other things that can go on trails and roads, golf carts. There are new um, uh, e-assisted um, high-tech bikes coming along. Let's go to that slide. Uh, some of you may have seen me uh, uh, checking out uh, the pod bike at Schwetzi the last few years. It's coming along. It's going to start coming out now. They're, they've got their newest uh, prototypes out there, and I think later this year they plan on coming out with them. Car replacement kinds of things. E-assisted, does have pedals. And then uh, go to the next slide. Uh, this is right in Doug's wheelhouse. In fact, that's one of uh, Doug's valuable. Looks, oh, oh, wait, I've seen that. Brick, I've here. seen that brick wall before. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> talked about that. I have too. So, Doug, you want to take a quick uh, a tour through what's going to be with the uh, with these special vehicles? Well, so the thing about these vehicles are, as well, they're very high tech. Uh, carbon fiber shelled uh, vehicles. They are inherently bicycles underneath. So either you know they either have a tricycle bicycle type frame. They have bicycle components. Uh, if they didn't have a motor motor in them, they would be effectively a tricycle. Uh, and so when you look at these from a perspective of where do they fit in the framework of all the stuff we've talked about legislation wise and rule wise and CPSC wise, all that, they're basically bicycles. They're not designed to go beyond those limits. And in fact, a lot of them, you simply can't do it. There's either not enough room to mount the motor or the, 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 uh, the, the manufacturer themselves say, you know, we don't recommend anything over, you know, 250 Watts. Uh, because they're there and you look at, we had the pop bike up a second ago. That's basically a, a bicycle. It's got Bosch motors in it. It's, it's got a normal kind of bicycle frame in there. All the stuff that's good, heavily modified. It looks very different. It operates different, but it doesn't have anything that you, you wouldn't find on any number of other bicycle style vehicles or tricycle style vehicles in a store. Doug, so let me jump in here with me because it occurs to me that the big difference here be, uh, between these sorts of vehicles and what we've been talking about is the mystery to law enforcement of oh, what's yeah. going on underneath there. And that's going to take us into what happens yeah. if you get stopped. But clearly, if you see this, if you see this coming down the street or on a trail and you are, uh, you are um, charged with enforcing uh, e-assisted uh, bike laws or, or uh, street laws, you don't know what the heck's going on underneath there. And uh, and so you're likely to get stopped. And Doug, I think maybe this is a good time for us to go to that particular question. What happens if you get stopped? Now we'll start out, uh, we'll, I'm gonna have Steve, I think, talk about what you should do if you do get stopped. But Doug, you have some, <laughs> some well, really personal kinds of things. Uh, yeah, let's go one slide forward to that yeah, one. Let's go and, on, and, yes, next and there's slide. A, there, there's yeah. a chat question that comes up here in a second that I wanna address too. Yeah, from tell Thomas us about Breedler. your personal and then let's, we'll talk about so, it. So, so you know, obviously I ride a Velomobile. It looks like it, probably could be any number of flying saucer type objects and frequent as any other velomobile pilot that well not what we call them velomobile pilot will tell you we always get stopped by the police it's not uh, uh you know it's not <laughs> and not a very uncommon occurrence and they always think there's a motor in it and you always have to talk uh, talk about whether or not there's a motor in it i usually say mine runs on uh, mexican food and cheap beer but uh <laughs> it, it's very common to get stopped um, you do get stopped more often on trails uh, because the, the, the trails situation is that, you know, people see that and they immediately <laughs> flip out their phone, dial 911 and say somebody's running a motorized vehicle on the trail. Uh, so it, it, it's very, it's not, not uncommon at all. You're going to see that more in these kind of vehicles than you would say on a tricycle because it's obvious to the, to the officer that there's pedals out front and they can see them. Uh, 
as, as we kind of alluded to, there was a particular trip we talked about before on this program where I was in California coming across the U.S. and I got stopped five times trying to leave San Diego. And every single time it was, you know, do you have a motor? And, you know, we had to go through the episode of no, there's no motor in there. And I even offered one of one time for them to just, you know, if you stick your nose down here, you'll find out I'm actually pushing this vehicle. And here's uh, Doug Grossjean. And, and yeah, Doug Grossjean's yeah. another one. Can play I, I was going to say, Doug, that I think most of the, from what I've heard, most of the encounters end up more like this in that previous slide. Uh, yeah. But uh, you you still have to know what's going on and how to how to uh, prepare yourself because I think you're going to get stopped uh, eventually if you ride enough. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's absolutely fair to say. And, and what's important to know to do, and, and I'll turn this to Steve at this point, is what happens when you get stopped and you're not sure of the law. Right. And that is the perfect segue to our pal, Steve, <laughs> because this is what he does. And he's got lots of literature that he disseminates about this. Steve, let, you take over the discussion here. Tell us about the situations you well, encountered and what to do. Well, I mean, first of all, you have to know the law. You should know the law. So if you're if you're not doing your own due diligence and you're driving something around and you don't know if it's legal, you don't know what the rules are. Now, I have my my handy dandy bike law card. And this is the, the, I designed this from a painting. It was done by Talia Lempert. She's an artist in New York city who makes her living painting bicycle portraits basically. And she allowed me to use the card. And so when you get pulled over, I tell people, look at the card. It's a nice calming picture, calm down. And then you flip the card over and on the back, whoops, there we go. I'm not good with that. On the back, I have a summary of Ohio bike laws. I'm going to do one for E related things as well, because that's going to be coming up next. But I have a, I have all of the various uh, key bike laws with the actual code section. So you can flip it over and say, well, you know, they're, if you're riding two abreast and the officer says you're not allowed to do that, well, you know, if you flip over to 45, 11, 55 in your officer training code book, it'll say that we're allowed to ride two abreast wherever. So number one, you got to know what the laws are. If you don't know what the laws are, then you're, you're at a loss. You can't argue with the police officer. You can't have a discussion with them. You can't uh, do anything except sort of bend to whatever they say uh, is the law. And, or, and often we find they don't know the law, or if they do know the law, they have their own version of what they think you ought to be doing. And, and if you don't want to follow that and you don't have a reasonable explanation why you don't have to follow that, then, um, then they'll, try to impose their will on you and move you off the road or further to the right or whatever it is that they're objecting to. So, I mean, you're, the premise of the question was, what do you do if you don't know the law? The answer to that is you're stupid. You should know what the law is, where you're riding. You should do that research before you go to some new jurisdiction. And when you get there, you should be able to have an intelligent conversation with somebody that, that wants to stop you and talk about it. So, um, that's not the best answer I know, but it's, no, it's a good know, answer. If, if, you, if you don't know, then you're at you're at their mercy. I mean, you know, so if you don't know what the traffic laws are, you know, you're at their mercy. Specifically, then we're going. Of course, we're going to have uh, Steve's uh, uh, the link to Steve's uh, <laughs> website there. And if you're in Ohio, of course, uh, I'm going to have his uh, email there, and Steve will send those to you uh, if you oh, need yeah. it. It's going to be a basis for knowing about the laws in other states, but I guess you can't use it That's quite right. as specifically. But it, again, I guess I would I would point people to that People for Bikes site to get your local laws. Your uh, the also state the, uh, the, yeah, the that's a good site. The League of American Bicyclists has yeah. and uh, several educational pages. I think they have a link to all the laws of every state. Uh, there's a list of lawyers on there. I know I'm on there. The, the bike law.com folks are on there. There's, there's lawyers around the country who do this kind of stuff it, more from the accident perspective, but all of the people that are on the LABs list are all cyclists. They all do all kinds of bike related, you know, legal stuff. I can't make money defending traffic tickets, but uh, we do it and we help people out when we can. And people call me and we talk through this stuff, you know, and um, I'm happy, like I said, I'm happy to send out I, my my crash cards and my, my bike law cards. I send them out in packages of 10 or 100 or 1,000 to, to be distributed wherever. Uh, and I've had, there's actually a great video of a guy up in Northern Ohio who gets stopped by the police and he pulls the card out of his bag and he's like, he's got his helmet camera on and you see him 
you know, flipping it over and going through the thing with the officer and, and, and he walks away without a ticket. So, um, you have to be knowledgeable. You have to be able to talk intelligently and rationally and not in a, you know, in a hyper excited mode. So, all right. Now, let's say the we worst, a- wait, hang on, Doug, let me, and I'm going to get back to you. I'm sorry. Let's say that the worst happens though. And I, we, we have seen situations like this that you've, uh, you've been stopped. The officer doesn't like what's going on. It maybe it escalates, whatever. And you have your bike or trike or velomobile confiscated now, what to, what would be the process? What would you recommend if something like that happened? <clears throat> yeah, you need to call counsel. You need to get a lawyer right away because there's uh, if if you're if it's escalated to the point where they have put their hands on your stuff and taken it away, so now there's a forfeiture of your property, uh, uh, right or wrong. There's going to be a legal process that you have have to go through to get that back. And you're going to want to do that with counsel. You're not going to want to do that on your own. And they're likely not going to give it back to you anytime soon. So you're kind of stuck at that point. I would, I would imagine, I can't imagine them taking it and then giving it back to you right away. So there's, there has to be some process, whether it's local or state uh, that, that you're going to have to go through to get it. In Ohio, for a while, we had these uh, goofy little city laws where uh, they would say, if you come into our city, you have to stop at the mayor's office and pay six bucks and get a little tag and put it on your bike while you're riding. It's a little special license that you have to use in our city. And if you don't do that, we're going to take your bike. And so we, we were, we've been successful in getting those, um, uh, oh, taken away, let's say, uh, taken off the books. But, you know, those are still out there. And it may be local, it may be some, it may be in some goofy mayor's court in the middle of nowhere, or there may be some state law process, but um, call a Get lawyer. a right lawyer. Away. There you go. Right. That's, right. that's the good answer. Right. Okay, John, go ahead. You, I know you had something to well, add. Well, I was going to, actually, I was going to make a comment of that, then go back to what I was going to say. Uh, I had, we had a city band bicycles on the main drag. I had to it took me two weeks to ride my bike back and forth across the mayor's lawn before I got a ticket so I could have standing <laughs> to go fight it. Uh, but we'll go back to the summary of laws slide, because this is really important. Uh, something that's come up on chat. I, we missed it earlier. and It's my fault because it was in my hand, hands to talk about it. Um, oh, it's the right before the, it's not that one. It's the green and green and blue one about just past the velomobile. Yeah, so, it's down, 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 down. Keep going, keep going, keep going. One, two, one more. There, there stop. Okay, so well, this popped up in chat. It pops up here from time to time again, and it's about the legality of the vehicle based on the number of wheels. And this is a really strange part of law. Steve, you could probably help me out with this. Yep, yep, there, yep. Are, there are safety definitions and what consumer products are defined as. And then there are operation definitions. And these two are not necessarily the same thing, even sometimes, even though sometimes they refer to each other. So right. the Consumer Product Safety Commission defined a bicycle consumer product as having two or three wheels. That's it. It stops there. That's a safety law. Nothing else. Now, your state defines the transportation in which you can operate. Some states say human power. Some states say human power, and then they have the exception with exist. Some people states say one, two wheels or more. Some states have three or more wheel, two or three or less wheels. They're all over the map when it comes to that definition. Um, However, they almost all have exceptions, and the exceptions come to handmade or one-off or other kind of vehicles. Even the CPSC says that in their code where they say, this is the general thing, but right here, if the bike is made for somebody or is specific to, an, you know, I think the word is actually if it's individually handcrafted uh, or individually ordered for that kind of stuff, then this doesn't apply. So it's a very interesting yeah. space. Now, Steve, mm-hmm. I, I don't know if I covered that well, well enough for you. Yeah, no, but the you have to go to, it's usually the 0.01, the first section of the traffic code that has a thousand definitions. And we just, I was just looking them up for the electric bikes in Ohio today. But the Ohio bicycle definition, what is a bike, has undergone three or four changes where it went from two wheels to Two in the two in the rear, one in the front, to th- three wheels, and then to four or more. And each one of those changes was brought about because somebody 
uh, did something to poke the legislature and let them know why that the way it was was bad. In the first case, it was one guy who got a change from his particular legislator. The second case in, uh, involved uh, the Ohio Bicycle Federation getting involved, and, and I got involved in one where this four-wheel roads car was thrown off the road, and we were able to get the legislature to finally say two or more wheels in right. Ohio. But not every state has that. You got to, again, you have to check, especially if you're going yeah. from Ohio to Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and, and on again, your way. No, you got to know no what law. the rules are. Right. Yeah. yeah, there's no this law. Is, it's the check wild, it wild west. There's no uniformity in this. So <laughs> All right. your, your state matters. My state has yeah. the hu human power, multiple wheel kind of thing. Right across the border in Oklahoma, it's two tandem wheels, which means even a cat trike isn't a bicycle. Right. Okay, guys, let me, uh, we got to kind of wrap this up. A couple more things here. I got a question uh, here from uh, Leo Horsney. Uh, Steve, and this is a really good question. You, we talked about all the possibilities and problems that could occur with all this. And Steve uh, emphasized when things get tough, make sure you get a legal counsel. So if you are in the state of Ohio, I know exactly who to call. But <laughs> for our viewers who are not in the state of Ohio, and Steve, you talked about this even on our last show. What's your recommendation for finding a good bike lawyer elsewhere? Well, the best place is probably to check with local advocacy groups who is helping the uh, Missoula, you know, bikers or the, you know, the St. Louis cycling organization or whatever. Uh, there are generally lawyers who ride. It's been that way. In fact, I have a book in here, 1895. The first bike law book was written by a guy in Wisconsin who was involved in the early LAW. And he chronicled all the cases up to that point and put them in a book. So uh, for the last 120, 30 years, there have been lawyers who ride bikes who are interested in these issues and who are sort of dotted around the country. Uh, the LAB has a list. If, if you can email me, I'll try to find someone for you. I mean, that's, I have uh, said in the, the LAB Legal Affairs Committee, I've worked with lawyers all over the country on different civil cases and, and trying to find folks for that. I mean, unfortunately, the, the reality is that a ticket is something that it's hard for a lawyer to make money on. So unless you find somebody to really help you out, paying somebody 250 bucks an hour to fight a $75 ticket is kind of a losing, uh, you know, can be a losing battle, but that's why you want to find bike friendly people who are interested in these issues and then interested in, in working with folks to try to help them out. Very good. All right. I want to finish up with two quick things here. First of all, Doug, we touched on this earlier. I want you to, I, I know you feel very strongly about this. The reasons that some of the tougher laws and regulations are out there that we discussed today have a lot to do with what people's perceptions are of what they see on e-bikes and maybe some of the reality that they see. Uh, people taking advantage with uh, overpowered uh, bikes and trikes or modifying things that they shouldn't be modifying and being a danger and that sort of thing. Uh, basically, I think what we're saying here is please don't be a jerk. But tell me, tell me, I know you feel strongly about this too. Let's kind of wind this up if we can with. I have another word than jerk that I use. Yes, well, please go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it might, might not be good for primetime TV. I think the FCC has that one on its list. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of issues here and, 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 and I know I'm not unique. I mean, this is something there. We, 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 people, you know, they, they push the envelope. Uh, that's probably the polite way to say it. Uh, and we've, it's caused legislation to happen. It's caused bikes to get banned. It's caused mm -hmm. municipalities to enact no e-assist laws uh, it, because somebody has exceeded what would be a bicycle like limit, uh, a, a normal, a very fit bicyclist. And, you know, sometimes, and some days I'm, I might actually qualify as one, uh, they're capable of putting out a few hundred Watts for a few minutes and that's it. Then they're going to back down into the 200 watt range, and that's about what they're sustaining. Even you go and you look at some of the Tour de France riders and these Cat One guys and things like that, they're not putting out 750 watts for hours and hours and hours. It's just not physically humanly possible. So, 
we, 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 when I do my advocacy and legislative work, that which which I do, we try to advocate this stuff to say, make the laws work for a bicyclist in a bicycling con- situation and then transpose that to what happens when you put a battery on it and a motor. Very good. Very and, good. And, 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 and the people that want to live outside of that envelope, those are the ones that are causing the problems. And mm-hmm. they are really doing it. So don't be a um, jerk. We'll use your word. Instead of Very good. <laughs> That's the word of the day, I guess. All right. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> important, folks. It really is important. You know, try to stay within the bounds if you can. It just harms everyone when you don't. So, all right. We're going to finish up then with how our viewers can learn more and how they can be advocates uh, in their own states. Um, so, Steve, I'm, I'm going to ask you, if you can, how can people... Uh, be an advocate for getting the best e-assisted laws done in their particular uh, jurisdictions? Well, every uh, state has statewide bicycle advocacy groups. We have the Ohio Bicycle Federation here in Ohio. Uh, We have a central Ohio group. We have Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, every big city and a lot of small cities we have regional bicycle groups. We're kind of a hotbed of cycling stuff here between rides and advocacy. And those are the people that are are uh, looked at by the legislators as sort of the, uh, hopefully, sort of the experts in this stuff. And so when we come in armed with data and armed with support with the, you know, the league or support with the national cycling groups, you know, we can come in and, and try to get some things done. Now, it's tough to get things done legislatively on a statewide level uh, on bicycling issues. It's, even in Ohio here, we it's been 10 years since we had a major cycling bill passed back, well, more than that in 2006. Uh, we got the three-foot law passed after seven years of fighting. We added 22 words to the passing law and got that. And then the e-bike came about without any help from us really at all. It was mostly the, uh, the uh, national organizations that came in and, and uh, schmoozed whoever they had to schmooze to get that bill uh, through in a hurry. So you really have to be able to band together politically with, with uh, national groups, uh, national advocacy groups, state advocacy groups, and local groups. And it's not something that happens in 15 minutes. Uh, it Sometimes it takes years uh, to get things done and changed, even a small change like a a change definitionally in what a bicycle is that can take, you know, if you get the right lightning in a bottle, you can get it done in two weeks. Uh, but it might also take two or three years to get that pass. And you just have to keep, it's a grind zone. You just got to keep pushing it, keep pushing it. All right. So, and Doug, did you have to want to finish up with any other recommendations for advocacy? Uh, you know, there certainly get involved in your local advocacy group. And some of those need almost training on e-bikes and e-bike situations. Um, send them my, you know, they need help. Send them my way. I'm more than happy to, to, to point them in the right directions. But these local groups have a lot of power. Um, and particularly they have a lot of power where we're having the most struggles out here, which are these multi-use paths and other bike trails that, that, that something happens. And the first reaction was, oh, my God, we can't let an e-bike on a trail because, it, you know, somebody was a jerk and did something and so all of a sudden everybody's clumped into the jerk category and some municipality blocks a trail uh through their through their thing through their municipality which of course on either side of it it's it's okay so you know get involved with that uh get really if you're if you're interested in a sister plan on that find your local advocacy advocacy group and 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 and, and, and get with them so you know what's going on absolutely uh, one other thing, we have a group in Ohio called Yay Bikes, and the uh, executive director is Catherine Gervis, and she's implemented a a, uh, uh, a thing where she will go to a city, whether it's a big city, small city, and she will set up rides with the local people, either uh, politicians or particularly people in the engineering office, and she'll map out a ride that takes them through some interesting bicycle uh, situations, which they don't realize because they drive them every day in a car and they never think about, well, how does a bicycle handle this particular intersection or this roundabout or this gravel or whatever it is, uh, and opens uh, the eyes of legislators quite a bit with this idea of getting them on a bike, getting them out, getting them riding with her 
in riding through these things and they sort of self-discover, oh, gee, this, you know, this kind of stuff is important and could be dangerous. And I could see the same sort of advocacy happening in the e-bike uh, world as well. If that becomes an issue locally, you can get folks out to ride with you and get them to see what you're facing and, you know, see that, A, you're doing things right, but there's these legal challenges or these, you know, situations that we have to overcome. And um, that yeah. can be very effective. That sounds like a great way to sensitize uh, the people who make the laws. I, Absolutely. That's a cool idea. I, I agree with that. All right, guys, we're going to wrap up this segment here. Thank you so much, Steve and Doug. Um, wonderful discussion. I hope uh, <laughs> this was uh, useful for you. Uh, Popeye didn't enter into the oh, he's, my new, yeah, he's my new spokesperson there. there Whoops, there you go. go. There we go. So, <laughs> yeah, go out and buy a can of spinach if you can. And uh, Steve Magus, the uh, Ohio <laughs> Bicycle Lawyer, thank you so much for for helping us out. We will oh, see happy you again. To help. Yeah, happy to help. Call me anytime. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And Doug, uh, we'll you, Doug. talk to you a little bit later. So, all right, all right. Uh, Lars, if you can um, bring it back to me here. There we go. Uh, folks, we're going to move on to our next segment, which is going to involve our pal, Larry Varney. Everybody knows Larry. And Larry was, as I mentioned in the introduction earlier, down in Florida a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was at the big honking trike rally. I don't know how good the rally was, and I'm going to let Larry tell you about it, but it does have, like, I think the best name of trike rally anywhere. Uh, Larry, we got some pictures. Uh, we're going to cue those up. Uh, Trey, if you get ready with that first one, we'll, we'll let you start, though, Larry. Um, and uh, tell, us about, uh, tell us about your experience at the big honking trike rally. Okay. Uh, first thing I'd like to say is it was a lot of fun. It was almost a last uh, moment decision to go down and do it, and I'm really glad I did. And it remind me of another rally, the Tater Tot Rally that's out in uh, Idaho, except it's a whole lot closer. <laughs> so I thought, to, but they're both of the same nature where they're semi-organized. Uh, there's no registration fees or anything like that. They have sort of a... a, a a listing of rides that they're going to be doing that day and you can go on them or not or you can go off and do your own thing and that's pretty much the way the big honk and trike rally was i'm not sure how long it's been going on whether this is the second year or what but i'm pretty sure that i'll be going back there in the future and that picture there shows me actually i was sitting and waiting on some other people to show up and i set my camera off behind me and did a selfie and you can see my cap there. That's from the Walls, W-A-L-Z, cap people, uh, one of my favorites. So anyway, that's uh, a short introduction to what this uh, rally was like. It's down on some of the trails there, the Withacoochee, and there's another one up by uh, Ocala and so on that the group goes on. And I've got some pictures there of, uh, from some of those trails. And some of the people that were on, on the ride, there were about 50 bikers there at least. Uh, that's sort of the central point there. That's an Inverness in the background. You can see their water tower. And further on back, you can't really see it as the uh, railroad uh, car that's sort of, you know, really emblematic of that whole area. And the Wittacoochee Trail is right off to the right-hand side. It's a great trail to ride on. I would say the weather's always that pretty, but sometimes it rains. But that trike there is the... Uh, Catrike Eola, which I rode briefly at a recumbent cycle con last year. And as I told people back then afterwards that uh, I was expecting sort of, eh, you know, an okay trike um, because of the price mainly. You figure the cheaper, the less it's going to be impressive. That one impressed me a lot. It was comfortable. It rode smoothly. It handled great, great turning circle. Um, Larry, if I can jump in quickly, we have that oh. question about the, that storage bag there on that eel. Oh, can yeah. Talk about that for a second. <laughs> okay. That comes with the trike. It's, uh, I think I've got some other pictures showing from the rear that show it better, but it basically attaches with some little Velcro straps around the rear of the frame. Um, yeah, you can see it there uh, just below there by the fender. And you can put most of your essentials in there, wallets and phones and stuff like that. Uh, one of my only complaints about the Catrachiola, and I did a fuller review out on Bent Rider Online, was that some of us, like me, like to carry a lot of crap, and that bag just won't hold my big camera and stuff like that. And, Larry, would that fit on a 700? You've got a 700, do you know? Hmm, I don't know. I, uh, it might, 
because I mean it's not that big, and the seven hundred does have the uh, the tubes running down, so probably it would. I would say it's worth a shot. Now the one thing that might be a problem I'm just thinking about, and I hadn't thought of it before, the seven hundred's got a larger rear wheel than that, that twenty inch on the Eola, so that might have a problem. Maybe I'd have to go out and look at my seven hundred and imagine if I had that bag sitting there. So okay, or you could try it on your seven hundred eventually. Oh, yeah. oh, you don't have it. It's no, I don't have it. Right. Just a okay, longer. all right. Yeah, to, and Larry, go ahead and and you can tell Trey when you need the next slide. We'll let you. Put okay. You in charge. All right. I'll try to confuse him and say, "Oh, go back to the previous one." No, I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, that picture is of some of the crowd before the start of the ride, and you can see quite a few people on there. Uh, I don't know if you can't see my mouse pointer, but almost in the center off of the left beam, there's a, a yellow outfit. That's Amy Spadafora. She was down there for the event, and she always wears something that really stands out. That's it, Trey. Trey's <laughs> pointing her out. That's our, that's our pal. Well, actually, I think it's off to the right. You know, oh, somewhere that's not her? Yeah. Okay. I think it is. We'll see her in a bit. So anyway, you can go to the next one. That, oh, that was the water tower, too. And yeah, on that picture there, that's at the northern terminus of the Withlacoochee Trail, which I expected the first time I rode up to that, that it would be some great view of the Gulf or something. No, it's not. There's just trees and stuff around us into the trail. But uh, they've got a sign telling you about it. And I think, yeah, in bright yellow there, that's Amy right there in the middle again. But you can, you can get an idea about how many, there was all kinds of trikers there. Quite a few more electric trikes too. Um, I'd say at least a third, if not more. Uh, I did see one or two tandem trikes, but most of them were, you know, ice trikes, cat trikes, that sort of thing. So you can go on to the next one. This is the land bridge trail that's up in Ocala. And it goes literally over I-75, and you can see it there in the background. And that's really kind of neat because I've passed under it before when I'm heading south on 75 and thought, oh, I'm going to have to go up there and do that trail one of these days. And last year when I was in Florida, I thought about going up and doing it. And I got kind of lost and was never able to find the trailhead. But this time I was lucky and I was able to find it. And that's where basically a lot, one of the rides started from. And it's really kind of neat, that particular section of the trail, um, it, it's kind of hilly. I mean, they're not huge shows. They're not something like being in the mountains. But if all you're used to is Florida, it's going to be hilly. But it's really scenic. Uh, it's yeah. it's a pretty trail. And I've uh, oh, yeah. my wife and I have ridden that uh, a couple of times. And it's right through uh, it's it's right through horse country. It's oh, unexpected. Yeah. But there's a lot of horse uh, a lot of horse uh, ranches stuff. right there. <laughs> a lot of horse stuff. Yeah. And a so, lot of horse stuff. Oh yeah, you can and on that trail. And that's another thing that I saw that sign. I thought, are they kidding? Um, how did I get back to the Smokies? But no, that's, uh, there are, this is the Ocala National Forest and they do have bears. So if you have to venture off into the woods for some sort of biological urgency thing, be aware there might be something out there that might eat you. So be well, careful. there might be something out there that is looking to solve one of its own biological urges. Yeah, you know, so be careful. But I saw that and I thought, oh and speaking of horses, I'm sitting there on the trail at the overlook, or if you want to call it that, over the interstate. And I have to look around. Here's these two women coming up by me. And they were, the horses were kind of confused. It's like, what the hell's that? You know, uh, but uh, I guess they've seen them before. But you can rent horses. You can bring your own horses. Uh, right close to where we started was a big horse rental thing. So if you want to rent a horse and ride on the trail one day and then ride a trike the next, you know, it's a great idea. So really kind of neat. So go to the next one. And yeah, there's the, the turnaround of that particular trail. And you can see there's a group of people looking for any excuse to stop and talk, I guess. But, uh, you know, it's a lot of trikes. Uh, and here, oh yeah, go on to the next one now. Speaking of the hills, uh, this was sort of a telephoto shot. So it sort of like squished everything together a bit. But there's little hills and curves and stuff. And it's kind of neat. And one thing you got to be careful with don't go really fast down some of those hills and trails because there could be somebody coming up the other side. So, you know, it's a good warning to say, no, don't, don't get over into the other lane. Don't act like you're in a race or anything. But that was some of the group heading back up to, to the start and a uh, lot of fun. So yeah, I'll go to the next one. 
I don't know why I'm flipping my hand. You can't see me. Uh, this was on the Withlacoochee, uh, I think, on our first day's ride. And we were heading south toward the southern end. No, that was the second day ride when we were heading toward the southern end. And you can just see in a couple of the pictures just how many trikes, you know, just when you think, oh, that's it. And no, there'd be another mass of them coming down. So a lot of, a lot of people. So, okay, go ahead. Yeah, there's some more. Uh, let's see if there's anybody in there that you might recognize. I don't know. Uh, Barb uh, from, um, well, anyway, go on to the next slide. That's just a bunch of people. There, there's at the end of another trial, trail that was there that was uh, new to me. It's called the Good Neighbors Trail, and it's down near the southern end of the Withlacoochee. You can take, hang a right and head out to Brooksville, which I've only been through Brooksville just a few times. Uh, and haven't spent that much time over there, but it's really nice to be able to take that trail, go over there. This is close to the terminus of the Good Neighbors Trail. Once you get to that end, you can just turn right on this, well, you know, easy to travel road going up a very slight hill. And there's a really nice restaurant near the top of that hill. Uh, Denny Solomon and another, a group of us ate up there that uh, particular day. I and think it was probably uh, Denny Voorhees. Uh, yeah, there he is. You, yeah, and there we you, go. You can see there's a group of people off to the left there looking off to the side. That's Regis Hampton. Behind him, you can't see her, is his wife Cindy. Uh, that's Ruth Glick up there on the, the near left. Uh, let's see. And there's, uh, yeah, Denny Boer, he's off to the right. And this other couple, I'm not sure their names, if they were friends of Regis and Cindy. And they're really nice restaurant, nice people, got to meet the manager and everything. And uh, I would say, yeah, if you're in the area, stop there and get something to eat. Yeah, and it, there was uh, at least one uh, Velomobile on, on the right. I'm not sure who was in that, uh, but I, I had to stop and take a picture. Okay, yeah, there's my favorite picture, I think. This is just real close to the Central Motel there in uh, Inverness. And I was looking for excuses to you know, want to take a picture of the uh, Eola next to for the review I was writing. And of course, there's lots of the big trees and the, the moss and stuff. And I thought, oh, this will be good. And I really do think the picture turned out well. And yeah, brand new trail off the Wetha Coochie. Yeah, that was the, the good neighbor's trail. But this was around. And this here is one of the lakes up there by Inverness. And I'm standing there. At, um, yeah, Denny took this picture, come to think of it. And you can see that I, you know, even though I was far away from home, I was still thinking of Bard's Burgers and stuff. So I had to wear one of their T-shirts and the waltz cap to match. So uh, anyway, it's a, it's a great trike. Uh, go to Bent Rider Online and read the rest of the view. Uh, the review. Uh, some people may think of it as well, just an entry level trike. No, it's much better than that. Uh, I could probably spend most of my riding time on that. Um, I do miss the many little pockets under the seat that most cat trikes used to have. Um, this one does have one good size pocket, but you know, I carry a lot of unnecessary crap. Uh, it doesn't have suspension. It doesn't have a folding ability in that, but it's relatively light, uh, relatively inexpensive. Uh, yeah, Sean, that's sad, all right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, as Danny said, he was the only two wheeler on the ride, but uh, yeah. Take a good look at that trail, at that event. Next year, show up at it, the big honk and trike rally. Hopefully, they'll have it again. And if you're interested in a trike that's simple and good quality, uh, made in the good old USA and all that, um, take a look at it. Oh, and one person once told me that he wasn't crazy about the recline angle. Uh, it doesn't have an adjustable recline, but like I always tell people, sit on the thing first because what feels great for one person may not for another. I particularly love the seat, but uh, find your local cat trike dealer and sit on the thing. And if they'll let you take it for a ride, definitely do that too. But uh, I came away from there really liking the trike even more and really liking the big honking trike rally. So I plan on going back again. Great way to finish. And uh, did you find cheese curds down there at all? Uh, no, I, I had to, I, I've had to subsist on uh, going to the nearest grocery store and getting uh, Coke and uh, some Oreos. So that helped. 
All right. Larry, thank you so much for sharing that uh, triking adventure and the EOLA as well, the cat trike EOLA. Um, I think that's uh, valuable information for people who are looking for a trike as well. And uh, Larry, I think we're going to, we talked about a little bit, have you on a little bit more regularly with uh, some more kinds of reviews and that sort of thing. It's great to have you with us today. Okay. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll see y'all. All right, Larry. All right, folks. Uh, let's move right along here to the sports report. As I said at the top of the show, Denny's got lots of interesting stuff to talk about, and uh, and we're going to bring Doug in in a couple minutes, too, to talk about uh, a special announcement. So, Denny, why don't you just take it away? Hey, hi. How you doing? Uh, it was great to have Larry down here for a week, and we and, uh, really enjoyed it. It was a great rally. I, I also like to add that uh, – they threw a, a free barbecue the first day, and it was excellent. A uh, great bunch of people there uh, yeah, out of the uh, Inverness group that uh, rides that, that put that together just on their own. It was it was a lot of fun. Met a lot of great people. Okay, I have several stories this month. A couple are pretty historic. Uh, I attended the first what hopefully will become an annual event called the Battle of the Brands. By now, you probably know that Cruise Bike came away with the overall winner based on the number of miles ridden in the 100-mile and 12-hour race. Bachetta was second, and Schlitter Bikes was third. I should mention that the cruise bike tried turned out in force, and the majority of entrants were logging their miles on cruise bikes. This was, was all a resounding success, with the real winners being the many racers who tuned turned out to experience one of the largest gatherings of racing recumbents outside of an HPV event. Some riders were doing their first endurance race ever, and the satisfied smiles were very apparent. Over a quarter of all bikes in the race were recumbent or HPV platforms, 41 in total. Some of the notable finishers in the race were the 100-mile race Dave Lewis rolled a 3 Oh five forty nine. Think about that, folks. In a velo over an hour ahead of the recumbent riders, Mark Schieffer, I'm sorry, Mark Schieffer, Kyle Larson, and Alex Struhall, who all finished in the four hour, 12 minute window. The first standard bikes were 14 minutes back. In all, there were 17 recumbent finishers in the 100 mile race. Bernadette Gurrell was the first among all the women with a time of 522, and Barbara Gaylord was the third overall with a 549. Lucia Parker of the cru cruise bike Parkers won her age group in her first race ever. Uh, in the 12 hour race, Larry Oslin put in 12, 252 miles, good enough for first place of the recumbent group and third overall in the whole race. Incredibly, 40 miles into the race, Larry switched over to his backup bike, changing wheels and some other essential parts. This cost him about 15 minutes of valuable road time. Jim Parker and Rob Burr finished out with the top three recumbent finishers with 233 and 225 miles, respectively. On the women's side, Sandy Earl topped the leaders with 225 miles, riding a loaned Schlitter freestyle. She was followed by Maria Parker with 218 miles on a cruise bike and Kathy Palmer in third. The only entry in the 24-hour drafting race was Rob DeCoe, who logged 323 miles for the first in the recumbent category and 21st overall. There were many more finishers and age group winners, but for the first time since I've been doing these race reports, there are just too many to mention, and that's very, very cool. Uh, the C Texas Senior Games, uh, this is the next story. I have the report from uh, Bobby Schiffman, uh, who was a competitor in the race, uh, and this is a quote from him. I was not sure what to expect from the officials or the other riders, but to my surprise, everyone was friendly. Some of the upright riders asked questions about my recumbent trike, comfort, learning curve, steering, high-speed cornering, why a midsole cleat position on my cycling shoes, and the like. The biggest surprise and revelation occurred when they checked the final times. They had no idea that recumbent trikes were that fast. Of course, we know that it's not the machine, it's the motor. Sadly, the field contained only one other entry in the male division, uh, 60 to 65 age group, 
and uh, one entry in the mail, 60 to 64. There was just only two entries in the race. Since I was the only entry, it was me against the clock, which time trials are anyways. I wanted to turn in a good time and hopefully turn in a few heads and in so doing elevate the recognition for this re for the recumbent trike as a viable competitor and division. The recumbents were placed in a separate division, but we were allowed to line up in any order for the time trials. In the at the starting line, the riders were spaced at 30 second intervals. After my start, I caught a few upright riders and was passed by a few very strong upright riders. I won the 10K time trial at 21.25 and the 5K time trial at 9 minutes and 49 seconds in my age group. I am happy with my times, but I still have a lot of room for improvement. After receiving my second gold medal, I mentioned to the crowd, you old folks need to buy a recumbent so we can have some competition. Mike Turner from Corpus Christi rode a Cat Trike 700, and Mike was the uh, gold medalist in the 60 to 64 age group. All as I can remember about his times, I beat his time by two minutes in the 10K time trial and about 16 seconds in the 5K time trial. The course was in great shape, smooth road service, and a very hilly 3 to 6% grade with a 0.2 to 0.3 mile rolling, uh, two, yeah, long rolling hills. Wind was 10 to 15 miles per hour and was swirling around in the trees, which encompassed both sides of the roadway throughout the course. I was riding my cat trike expedition trike with spoke covers on all three wheels and lowered the lumbar support so I could lay flat around the seat, allowing for more aerodynamic position. There's a good tip right there, folks. I was not sure how well I would do on this race. Um, my 2020 training regimen has consisted of 1,120 miles of indoor riding on rollers. Many, many, many strength building intervals on the rollers. And thanks, Bobby, for that report. Pretty thorough. Uh, great to hear it. And and uh, it seems senior games are really starting to embrace the recumbent uh, platforms, especially the trikes now. So uh, on to the Hotter and uh, Hotter and Hell 100 announcement. And we're going to bring in Doug here. Go ahead, Danny. You need okay. to start it out, though. All right. Finally, a huge piece of news from the racing scene. A 100-mile road race at the Hotter and Hell cycling event in Wichita Falls, Texas. This 34-year-old event occurs the last weekend in August. This year, it is a bit historic. The Hotter and Hell 100 will host, and USA cycling officials will officiate a 100-mile road race for recumbents and velomobiles. The race will be operated like a USA cycling one-day race use USAC officials and follow a modified set of USA cycling rules tailored for our bikes. However, it should be noted that the recumbent race will be separate from conventional road racing bikes. So there's no mixing of platforms. It wouldn't be fair anyway, but it has a great possibility for the future. Oh, and there will be some prize money as well. Speaking of which, yeah, well, let's bring Doug in. And Doug, <laughs> well, what are, we, what are we talking about? Go ahead. Well, we're going to make a little history. I'm going to put up at least $1,000 of my own money to show how fast recumbents can be. I'm going to put it up, but I won't give it up without a fight. So if you're smart enough, quick enough, and lucky enough, you can win my money. While I'm going to ride my Velomobile, you don't have to compete directly with me. There's going to be prizes for single and multi-track recumbents as well. So it won't be too hard to win my money, but you'll still have to work for it. you got a couple of months to plan. Get your hotels and above all else, train for this historic opportunity. You know I'll be training as I have to explain to my wife what happens to my money if I don't win it back. <laughs> uh, seriously, though, I doubt I can win. I'm not all that fast, but, I'm a but I want to have a huge turnout for this event, and I'm hoping to put recumbent racings on the map of this public eye. And just in case that the thousand dollars isn't enough by August. I've got some really important stuff that we people around here really are looking for. You're <laughs> so, going to throw that in? I'll yeah. throw this in. I'll throw this in if it's more valuable. So it'll be the thousand bucks or it'll be, you know, some very important stuff the way people are going out here nowadays. There you All go. Right. Well, Doug's expected to wipe up the course anyway. That's exactly it. Sure, so. <laughs> All right. Oh, uh, Danny, go wow. ahead and 
Uh, wipe, okay. wipe up the course. Very good. Uh, Gary. Playing all yeah. night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, two drink minimum. You know, tip the waiter. Uh, Doug is putting out a good sum of money to entice and some paper too to entice some of the best recumbents and HPV riders in the country. We will continue to follow the story in the coming months, so stay tuned. Personally, I'm excited to see this, and it's been a long time coming. That's it for this month. Until next time, stay on the bike and keep moving forward. Back to you, Gary. Thank you, Denny and Doug. Uh, great report, Doug. Uh, good on you, buddy. That's uh, That sounds exciting. We look forward to uh, hearing a lot more about that uh, first sanction race. Uh, so we'll be reporting on that right along. And uh, folks, if you have... Uh, if you have some suggestions on how Doug can uh, make this a bigger event than it already seems like it'll be, let us know. Let Doug know. Folks, let me talk to you about the sponsors that make this show possible. We love our sponsors. And they're going to start out with TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And Trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida near that with Lacucci trail that uh, you saw Denny sitting on, please stop in and see Andrew and his crew. Remember, for a limited time, get a free trike for your buddy when you buy a new Azub or HP trike at Trailside. Again, check the link in the description below for the restrictions and details. And Cruise Bike. Their patented race and record proven front wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance, but fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And TerraTrike, wherever your ride leads, TerraTrike has a trike to take you there, including KMX carts and now green speed known for performance through innovation. And our newest sponsor, we welcome once again, the Hostel Shop. Until March 31st, purchase any recumbent from the Hostel Shop and get a $150 coupon towards the purchase of your recumbent accessories. What a great way to customize the ride of your dreams. The Hostel Shop. Very good. Brianna, thanks for uh, supporting us as our latest sponsor. We, uh, we sure appreciate that. All right, folks, on to the announcements. Many of you will know uh, who uh, routinely watch this show that a year or so ago, we had a young man uh, on the show uh, named James Dobson, who was uh, traveling the country on a quest uh, to go from coast to coast and, and raise some money for a children's hospital. And tragically, as I'm sure most all of you know, he was killed in Mississippi uh, during that trip when his trike was hit from behind with an automobile. Uh, a very sad situation. It's uh, been a year. This is uh, Cindy Dobson, his mother. And uh, she contacted me uh, last week. And uh, the exciting news is that uh, Cindy plans to complete her son's epic and tragic trike journey this November. So uh, here's what she told me. I will be starting right where James was killed in Mississippi, but out of respect for James, I will start on the 14th and not 13th uh, of November. James had 1,600 miles left, so I'm figuring it will take three months to finish. I am trying to figure it all out. I ordered a fully loaded ice adventure. I will be 56 when I start and have never done anything like this. It will be two years when I leave since James has passed, but it still feels like yesterday. I miss him so much, and I hope finishing his trip will help to ease my pain a little. I'm trying to get people to ride with me and someone to drive with us. I'm looking at RVs so we can just sleep in it at night. I will take all the help I can get. So, folks... Um, if you can, and you're, uh, in, we hope we'll all you will all follow uh, this story, and we will continue to follow. But we're going to have Cindy on at some point before the ride. But I hope that you will uh, contact Cindy if you can contribute by um, 
maybe supplying an RV or a ride along with her. I know a lot of people have talked about maybe riding along various sections of the ride with her. That would be great. So you can get a hold of Cindy at uh, cdobson64 at gmail.com or via a Facebook Messenger. Uh, I'm going to have uh, her email there in, in the links below. So you will see that as well. So good luck uh, to you, Cindy. Uh, we, uh, we're we behind you all the way on this. So, all right, folks, uh, let's talk about what's coming up uh, next month on the Laid Back Bike Report. This will be April 5th, Sunday, April 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. First of all, let's see that first slide. There we go. We have, uh, believe it or not, Peter Pan with us. Um, Peter is an interesting fellow who uh, is running trike tours uh, in Asia and uh, specifically in Thailand, which is where he's based. So he has a wonderful tour. You can see in this picture, and that's our, uh, that's our, pal, our pal uh, Matt Gallat, who uh, did a couple of really interesting videos uh, with Peter while he was visiting there in Thailand. So we're going to get uh, Peter on and talk to him about what he does there. And if you're interested in traveling, uh, to Asia, and he supplies the trikes, uh, beautiful scenic areas, of course. Uh, we'll talk all about that with Peter Pan. Also, we have Dana Lieberman. Uh, we haven't had Dana on for quite some time. He used to be a regular here. We're going to have him back, uh, I think, maybe a couple months in a row with some things. But uh, I noticed that Dana had worked on a couple of really beautiful uh, custom uh, builds in his uh, bike shop. Uh, Betta Bikes in California, and uh, this uh, custom VTX really caught my eye. So um, he's got some really cool pictures. He's going to talk to us about how he built that up and maybe a couple of other items as well. So it, we're excited to have Dana Lieberman back on the show with us. And uh, interesting news, we have Alv Henriksen uh, on with us uh, next month. Now, Alv created uh, this ride called... Um, 202020, in which he was encouraging other velomobile riders uh, to ride in um, 20 states or 20 countries, depending on where they happen to live around the world, and log those states in and have a tour sometime before the end of the year. Uh, Alv actually is leading the way, and he started um, from his native Sweden um, a couple of weeks ago and had made it to Poland. But as uh, uh, most of you are aware, things uh, with travel are not easy uh, these days. Uh, so um, he posted today, I noticed, that he was in Poland, but he's heading back home temporarily at least until things settle down with the uh, border closings and that sort of thing with the coronavirus. So uh, we're going to have Alvon anyways. He uh, has already taken a lot of pictures and visited, I don't know, like 10 countries already. A uh, very interesting guy has done a lot of touring with that uh, Quattrovello. So uh, he'll be on as well. And we look forward to having him. And I'm sure there'll be lots of other stuff to talk about too. So we're going to wrap it up uh, today with uh, one more chance to talk to you about uh, liking us on our Facebook page, subscribing to us on YouTube if you can. And you can click that little eye uh, that's going to pop up on the screen to find out more information, including how you can become a Patreon uh, patron. And you can do that for as little as a dollar a month. So if you'd like to financially support us, we would appreciate that. Uh, so um, those are the ways that you can, you can help us at the Laidback Bike Report continue to do what we're doing. I want to thank all my wonderful panelists and guests. Let's get uh, as many of them on the screen as we can. Oh, apparently Trey's already fallen asleep. Oh, no, there he is. He's all right. Uh, guys, thank you so much. That's not everyone uh, because we can't fit everyone on the screen right now. But uh, thanks for the directing and for all the media help and for all your segments and the moderating guys did a great job. And thanks for the toilet paper, Doug among other things. That was not the highlight of your appearance today. <laughs> um, anyways, we couldn't do the show without the wonderful help that we get from our panelists. So thanks, guys. And of course, I want to thank once again, uh, Brian couldn't be with us today, but he and Bent Ryder uh, always promoting uh, this show and helping us out in every way that they can think of. So thank you. And Larry, too, of course, part of Bent Ryder. So uh, thanks uh, to those guys. And most of all, thanks to all of you 
for watching the show like you do every month. So until next time, for all of us here on the Laidback Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders. Good show.